Welcome back to Metropolitan Community College's 15th Annual Diversity Matters Book Series. In Omaha, we've experienced a bit of difficult weather this week. So what a pleasure to be able to connect with you virtually from the comfort of your homes or other convenient locations. Your microphones and chat with other audience members are turned off. Send your messages or questions for our discussion leader through the chat function. Send them to moderator, Barbara Velasquez. I will present your questions to tonight's speaker. Also watch the chat for important messages. The online evaluation link will be presented. Also watch for an opportunity to win a copy of today's book, The Last Slave Ship. It has been a great pleasure for me to work with Mrs. Brenda Magruder, retired educator from the Omaha Public Schools, who has returned to and is living in her home state of Alabama the site for the history described in this evening's book. Brenda will further share with you some of her background during the presentation. At any time tonight, please send your questions through the chat. We understand that you may not have had the opportunity to read The Last Slave Ship yet, but all questions are welcome and will make the conversation much more enlightening. We are also hopeful that tonight's presentation encourage you to seek a copy of The Last Slave Ship from a Metropolitan Community College library or other location to dive deeply into this important American history. Please welcome Mrs. Brenda Magruder. Hello, I am Brenda Magruder and I'm actually from um, Montgomery, Alabama, which is about three and a half hours from Mobile, Alabama. Um, and my friend and I did go to Mobile to see uh, some of Africa town. We did not get to the waters to see the ship, but we did see the graveyard and all of that. Um, thanks to all of you for taking the time out to participate in this book discussion. And the important thing about the last slave ship, it is the last slave ship coming out of Africa, which was about 50 plus years after slavery was outlawed. And those on the slave ship were from the same community. They were friends, they were relatives. They spoke the same language. They had the same culture. Uh, they were slaves for five years. When the Civil War ended, they became free. And just a little background information. Um, in 1807, federal law prohibited transportation of slaves. In 1808, transatlantic triangular slave trade was outlawed by federal law. And these are the three things that were carried on the ships in the transatlantic slave trade. In 1859, Timothy Mayer, a very wealthy white man in Mobile, Alabama, made a bet with his friends that he could evade the Navy's presence and illegally bring slaves from Africa. In 1855, William Foster built the Clotilda and William Foster was the captain of the Clotilda slave ship. The Clotilda was a small slave ship uh, because it was meant to, to transport pro produce. Uh, and the fact that it was a small ship actually helped it in terms of evading some of the uh, traffic on the, um, on the Atlantic. In uh, July, 1860, 73 days later, the Clotilda docked in Mobile, Alabama. It had 110 slaves. They were supposed to have 125, but the Dahomey African tribe that they worked with turned them in and slave ships came after them. So uh, they had to leave with the 110 people that they had. And at the, uh, the, the homie, they destroyed Cujo's village. They killed the elderly. They killed the children. At the time, Cujo was 19 years old. Uh, the, the survivors captured, was taken to the barrack home, 
which is a slave holding place for them until they were ready to be transported to other areas. They were inspected like animals, including checking their teeth, feet, and skin. And before boarding the Clotilda, the clothes were ripped from their body. They were naked, terrified, locked in the slave's hold. Only 110 made it above the ship. They arrived in Mobile, Alabama, July, 1860. It's a 73 day trip from Benin, West Africa to Mobile, Alabama. In January, 1863, they had the Emancipation Proclamation and they had uh, in 1861 through 65, they had the Civil War, which is how they got free. In January, 1865, the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery was enacted. So they came in 1860. So that's why they were only officially slaves for five years. This is the American experience. Five years of slaves. After they arrived in Mobile, Alabama, the ship was burned and sank. They were in the swamp for 11 days amidst canes and reeds that were 30 to 40 feet high. They could not speak above a whisper. They had no cover or anything to protect themselves, their feet or anything. They were naked, exposed to flies, spiders, water moccasins, mosquito. They were finally given rags for clothing and they were divided. Typically among the mayor family, it was three brothers. They were divided among them and 34 of the slaves were sold to, in Montgomery, Alabama to slave dealers. Timothy Mayer was arrested because it was punishable. It was a crime punishable by death. He was arrested, brought before a judge. It was his friend, so he was never charged. They were out, uh, the Africans were outside and at the mercy of the elements. They had no structures to live in, nothing to cover them. So they were out in the rain, the cold, the winds, but the important thing about these Africans was they stuck together and they fought back because they came in as a community, one, uh, one cup, uh, one pitcher, and so they stayed together. And an incident in the book about how they stuck together and fought back is the Timothy Mayor's wife had a cook who said that uh, she wanted someone to help her. So they came up with a, a, a young girl from the Africans to, to help. Um, I guess the little girl wasn't moving fast enough for them. So the cook slapped her. And the child was so despondent because she wasn't used to that kind of behavior in her culture. She screamed, a loud scream. Obviously, it was something that was common to her culture because when she did that loud scream, everybody came, all of the Africans came and they were out in the fields working and everything. They stormed the house to see what was wrong with their child. Uh, Timothy Mayer's wife and the cook went upstairs, locked themselves in their uh, bedroom. She finally realized that she couldn't stay in there all night. So she came out and she talked to them, calmed them down, the cook left and was never and went to another place to work. That was one incident of how they stood together and fought back. The other incident was they had an overseer in the uh, fields with them who hit someone with a whip. They all accosted him, took the whip and beat him with it. They were just not accustomed to seeing that kind of behavior. They were ostracized. They were made fun of because of their dress. They had tribal mockings, their language. They did not speak our language. They spoke their own language. They were called cannibals, ignorant, savages, told they looked like monkeys. And this was not only from white people, this was from black people too. They, uh, the women worked in the fields, which is what they did in Africa. 
They were accustomed to winter weather. They were not accustomed to the winter weather that we had in Mobile, Alabama, which to some is not that cold. But for them it was because where they came from, the temperatures were about 70 degrees year round. So they were not accustomed to that. They chose partners to marry, but in some instances, Tim Maher, the boss, chose uh, partners for them to marry. Uh, an example of, he, he had an Indian slave named James Dennison, and he connected Dennison to Kanko. Uh, Kanko was a feisty African-American woman. And because it did not compare with the culture that she was used to, how they were married and all of that, she decided, okay, I'll do this, but I'm not gonna really be his wife. So obviously she really was his wife because they did have children. So they did consummate the marriage. Now, Dennison was an Indian and he planned to join the Union Army. So he was getting together some of the Africans to work with him so they could join the army. But just as usual, Somebody in their group told Mayor what they were doing. And so that plan was slotted. Uh, in 1865, the, uh, the colored troops charged uh, the rebel lines in Mobile in the battle, the last battle of the Civil War. And coincidentally, this happened on Mayor land. When the war was over, the Africans were homeless and they were unemployed. They celebrated their freedom by making drums out of logs and beating them like they did back in Africa with their tribal songs. They continued, this group, this 110 that came in, continued to practice their culture. They kept their names. They, uh, their, they wore the same kind of clothes that they had in Africa. In 1872, they decided to build their own Africa town, their own community. It was first called Plateau Town. Their dream actually was to go back home. Uh, so they planned to work to make money and pool it all together so that they could go back home. They chose to remain outside of the American society and the culture because they did not like the way they were treated by anybody, black and white. But they finally realized that the dream was going back home was not realistic. They didn't have enough money, they didn't have enough resources, and there was no way they could come up with enough money to go home. But they also realized too, what would home back in Africa look like? Our community is gone. Our families are dead. Will we end up slaves somewhere else? So they decided we're here in America. So we are going to make the best of where we are. So the women planted, sold fruits and vegetables from their gardens. And this was their culture in Africa. The men found work on railroad and other factories making $1 a day, they were free with no money and no land. Cujo, Cujo was the, smokesper the spokesperson for the community. So he was the one that they voted to go ask Tim Mayer to give them land because their thought is that you brought us here from our country where we had land. You made a slave. Now we are free with no country and no land. Mayor called Cujo a fool and told him, you do not belong to me now. I owe you nothing. When you were with me, I treated you good. Cujo took this information back to the community and they decided, um, they made an offer to Mayor and he agreed to sell. They bought 50 acres of land. They all worked together to build their homes. All of them pulled together. They built homes for each of them. They built a school. They built a church. They set up their own government, which was very similar to what they had in Africa. 
They had two judges to settle disputes, a medicine man, and Cudjo was the spokesperson and the church caretaker. Um, 40 of the original Africans remained scattered over 40 to 50 acres of land in 1893. In 1929 to 2000, you had the fall of Africa town. They had a growth spurt from, and they grew from 30 to 1200 residents because other people realized that something, what they had and they realized it was good. So some other people came, moved in also. They had industries, factories, paper mills moved to Mobile, on land that was actually sold to them by Timothy Mayer, the one who brought them here as slaves. The industries and neglect of the environment, pollution and ash from the paper mills left residents facing <laughs> cancer and many, many health challenges. Africa town now faced blight, decay and abandonment. The interstate, split the community, so socialization was hurt. The younger Africans were moving and assimilating in the American culture. Crack cocaine hit the community hard due to loss of income because of industries closing. And so now they were between a rock and a hard place and industries were closing because people were complaining about all of them getting sick. Well, many of them getting sick and dying. And that was because of the pollution and all the stuff from the paper mill. In 19, between 1939 and 1945, World War II was going on. So it meant more jobs. It meant more businesses such as barbershops, movies, theaters, butchers, farmers, pharmacies, hotels, and nightclubs. And Timothy Mayer here again was a major player in this because he was wealthy and had a lot of property. And at this time, some of the Africans were considered middle class. In the 1960s, it goes from idyllic to takeover. They had no standing about any complaints on their land because they were not incorporated. So the city officials claimed part of their land to build a road that ran straight through Africa town. So now the once idyllic community was now separated by Interstate 65, and then they had 110 that could take you through several Southern states. And it cut right through their community. It separated the church and the school from the rest of the community. So they had to navigate, try to navigate the interstate in order to get to the, the, uh, the church and the school. Now the state of Alabama ranks last when it comes to spending money to protect the environment. They didn't abide by the Clean Air and the Clean Water Act. In the 1980s, finding a future in the past. In the 1980s, John Smith championed the connection between the sister cities of Africa Town and Kadar Benin. Uh, and in 1986, they had an African folk festival and included in that was Jesse Jackson, John Lewis, Dick Gregory, and a delegation from Benin that came to celebrate. Uh, in 2005, Hurricane Katrina des destroyed the closest thing they had to a museum. And in 2006, John Smith was able to get a ballot in Alabama designed to set up a free trade zone for African and Caribbean goods. He died of a heart attack when he learned the ballot failed. That effort died with him. And his remains are interred in the museum in Kadar. An Africatown activist group has received $3.8 million grant to build a museum. Another grant was given to create a heritage center to showcase relics found in the hold of the ship. The Clotilda is an international artifact and is the only ship ever found 
that brought enslaved Africans to America. A hundred in 2019, 160 years later, the archaeologists confirmed the finding of the Clotilda. And now in Mobile, Alabama, you have clashes between those still in Africa town and those who have moved out and are not act, but they are active in community groups. Uh, the slave walk from Cujo's village to the Barracoon was four days. And of course, we know the Africans walked while the other ones navigated some other way. And it was interesting that the uh, Africans had not seen the water. They were not familiar with the, uh, the ocean and the water. And I think my, my opinion is that they knew that that was bad news because people could catch you there and take you away. So they ventured away from that. And in, um, in Qadar, in uh, Benin, which is now Benin, West Africa, they have uh, monuments to slavery victims. They have monuments to the Dahomey regime. There are still prominent wealthy citizens uh, in Benin with monument statues to honor their legacy. And the Dahomey uh, regime is the, the group of Africans that were notorious for capturing their own people and selling them into slavery. Brenda, can uh, I stop you just for a second? Uh -huh. yes, uh, we have somebody who want, would like to understand that environment better where African tribes were attacking other tribes. Mm -hmm. And and can you explain more about the Dahomey and how powerful they were and from what you read in the book? Yeah, they were a very powerful uh, African regime back then. Uh, and they still have relatives that are there now who uh, some of them want to make excuses for their behavior. And some of them are saying that it was just wrong and they were embarrassed by their behavior. But not just with the Clotilda, the African slave trade was a lot of the Africans were there because their other communities and villages sold them into slavery. And it was probably for money. Uh, some of it may have been because of fear of being taken over, the other one outgrowing them and being taken over. So their way of getting rid of that threat was to either kill or sell them into slavery. And that's basically what they did. And that's basically how they made the money. It and was a very wealthy undertaking. And in parts of the book, I think it mentioned 30% of Africans that came out of Africa got to America because of the Dahomey regime. So they were rampant with selling their own people. And you know, you could you could make a case whether were they better being sold as slaves or would they were they better off just by being killed like they did most of Cujo's family. The elderly and the children were killed. And and the way they describe it in the book, if you've read it or if you not, if not, you should read it because I mean it it's it's just heart wrenching, the way they killed people back then, and you know, and the other side of that is, um, all of the children were killed and all of the elderly were killed probably because they felt like they wouldn't bring much money anyway, because when they got them over here in America, they wouldn't be able to work or anything like that. Um, but there were, you know, there are stories about where on other slave ships, which were different from the Clotilda, uh, there were mothers who actually killed their children uh, and dumped them in the Atlantic and jumped, jumped with them because they were horrified and did not want to even think of where they were going and how horrible it would be because of the slave trip journey was 
a hard journey that a lot of our Black Americans did not make it through. Thank, thank you, Brenda. And one of our other um, participants threw out the word economics, which you said, you know, that mm -hmm. the money yeah. is a big money issue. Yes, it was lots of money. They made money from it. And I think if you, as you go through the book, and I don't have this written down, it identifies about how much money it would be today. Yes, it does. That in. I, yes, it tells you how much they made then, and it tells you how much money it would be today. Yeah. Thank you. Astronomical amount of money. Um, and the other, you know, this book focuses a lot on Kudjo. And as I said earlier, Kudjo was 19 years old when he was taken. And the interesting thing about Kudjo is when they were in the barracons uh, getting ready to transport them, someone took him out and put him under the building. Um, he And he stayed there for a while, but when they started loading the slaves onto the ship, he finally decided, he had this conversation among, with himself, and he decided, um, I have a lot of friends that are going on this ship here in Africa. My family, they're all gone. I don't know if the person who brought me here brought me here because they want me, they want to sell me to someone else. So he ran and got on the boat that took him out to the Clotilda in America. Who, and he could have stayed in Africa, he just didn't know what to expect. Um, Kudjo had a hard, hard life in America. He worked on the steamboat. So he didn't get to see a lot of his family and his cult. He didn't inter intermix with them that much because he was busy on the steamboat. And that was hard work. Um, and Kudjo was the last one to get his house built simply because he, at the time, was not married. And he said, I, he said, I wasn't married because I wasn't there with them that much. But Kudjo had five boys and one girl. Uh, all of his boys died tragically and mysteriously. Uh, the girl died at the age of 15. I think she had uh, yellow fever. Um, the wife never actually got over the children's death and she, they were all buried, uh, in the back of Joe's home where the cemetery was. Uh, and he mentioned that one night she, one day she got up and went out and said she was cold and that she wondered how her children were doing. So she went out to the cemetery uh, surveying all of the, the all of their graves. And then a week later, she was dead. So Kudjo was actually left with no family because they killed them all. Uh, Zora Neale Hurston visited Kudjo quite a bit. Um, and he told uh, Zora his story in his language, the broken language that he could. Um, so she wrote out a transcript and the powers that be were not satisfied with the transcript because of his broken English. Uh, Zora uh, decided that she wasn't going to change it, that he, she sat down and talked with him and this is what he relayed to her and that's what she was going to relay to the public. Uh, and because she didn't have enough um, financial resources, it was not published until like 2018. Uh, but uh, she said that Kudjo's last words to her is that Kudjo is not dead. He has gone to heaven to rest. He was 94 years old when he died. And at the time they were thinking that Kudjo was the oldest living of the original Africa town, but there was another lady, Sally Smith. She had taken a American name, Her name was Sally Smith. She died in uh, 1937. And, and if, you're, um, if you're very, very interested on Netflix, they have, um, it's called Descendant, and it's a two-hour documentary of the, um, of Africatown and that culture, too. 
and um, the the um, it's on the National Registry of Historic Places, and it's ranked like in uh, the top ten of towns built by African. But they um, the younger culture, younger generation. Um, some of them actually have forgotten and try to forget. Some of them were actually embarrassed by their family and did not want to own up to the fact that they were descendants of Africans. Um, and then some of them were very proud and they kept their history with them and they kept trying out, you know, tr trying thing, finding things out about their history. And especially when they realized that the, the Africa town story was breaking and that a lot of people were very interested in the Africa town story. So, um, but that is uh, in a that's a um, synopsis of the, the last slave ship. So we're getting some questions, Brenda. Okay. Um, when we were talking about the Dahomey kingdom, mm -hmm. The question is, wasn't the Dahomey Kingdom the subject of the movie, The Woman King? I'm not sure. And I saw The Woman King. I am not sure. Another one of our attendees says, yes, yes, yes. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. So um, what? Viola Davis, that's who was The Woman King. Um, she was the star of that. And I mean, it's another um, another mm. piece of evidence of the dominance of the Dahomey, right? right? Of the, the, yes. And they were, um, I can't remember, I think in the book, I think it said something about, I mean, they were dominant for like a hundred years or more. And, you know, just think of how many people, you know, got split from their families, murdered. And, you know, and, and one of the main things that they, in the book that they talked about, one of the main things that they did, um, and actually in the book, there's a story, you know, they, there's the little middle part of the book, they have pictures. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know if they showed the female, I think they did. Mm -hmm. There's a female and she's holding a head. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much what they did. You know, when they, when they captured, when they killed people, they would cut their heads off. And um, some of them, they were pulled, they talked about how they pulled their jaws out and they pulled their jaws out while they were still alive. And they used their jaws as um, the, the, the handle for canes is, is what they did. And, and there's a, like I said, there's a picture. And they also, they, uh, the Dahomey Kingdom, they had so many heads that they had actually cut off from their, you know, the people that they um, took over, they had them hanging up in their, in a, uh, the entryway area. So when people walked in, they could see those heads. I mean, just horrible things right. that you wouldn't want to see any human being do to any human being. Right. And, and it's, it's even worse when you realize that it's your people doing it to you. But then don't make don't make the mistake. There were others involved, and other like white folks, uh, the 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 Brits, the English, and all of them. They were all involved too, in uh, setting up these trades to um, America. They all benefited from it. And to further those comments about that movie. Um, the movie was criticized mm -hmm. for not doing more to condemn the Dahomey Kingdom for its practice of participating in the slave trade. Just throw that out there. And you know, they were they were nominated for something in the, was it what, uh, here recently? Is, is it the Golden Globes? I don't know. But they were on, I think the, the woman king, she was nominated for something. Uh, and and I, I didn't realize that, but yes, yeah. And they should have said more about that because um, 
that's a horrible kingdom to be putting on a movie screen. <laughs> yeah. And going back to the beginning of your conversation, Brenda, uh, this person may not have been there right at the beginning. Is it true that Mayer sent the Clotilda on a dare that he couldn't bring in a shipment of slaves after the slave trade was banned? That's how it started. They are exactly right. That is how it started. He was a wealthy man who felt he could do anything he wanted to do. And that was a crime punishable by death. As a matter of fact, one of his friends who were doing the same thing between bringing Cubans into, uh, uh, into Mobile, uh, he was caught and he was hung. Uh, so it was punishable by death, but actually by hanging is what the book says. The only thing about um, Mayer is that he had so much connection that, uh, and the judge that they, they, and he was, he was, you know, he was tried, but nothing became of it because the judge was his friend, but they are correct. That's how this whole thing started on a day. Too, that the reason why it took so long to find the slave ship is because he was lying and giving wrong information. All right. So, Brenda, we we are interested in what your favorite part of the book is, especially because you're a native of Alabama. Mm -hmm. Um, probably. You know, as I read through the book, and I was my friend who's right here with me. I, you know, I kept talking about. Um, it was interesting how the this group this 110 group of Africans were able to, most of the history I know and have seen, I don't know who would have been able to get by with storming uh, the, the, the um, mayor's house and having them run upstairs and stay. I don't, I just don't, you know, it, it was a surprise for me to see that. I'm like, oh, wow. They really did stick together and they really did fight back. And, but the other Africans that came before them were in different situations. They were all put on the slave ship. They were not, some of them didn't even know anything about each other. Uh, so that's, and, and they were a lot of, and a lot of the, you know, Africans were born in slavery too. So these Africans were acting on their community and how they were raised. And then the other thing in the book that I thought was interesting, same thing is how the, um, the overseer, you know, who could get away with taking an overseer's whip and beating him with it. And, and the comment that was made is, he never used that whip again on any of us. And I thought, okay. But I don't know if there were any other Africans that could have gotten away with that. And I'm thinking this partially is because of, they were here illegally anyway, they weren't supposed to be here. So, wasn't too many people going to do much about that because if they did, that would bring the spotlight back on Timothy Mayer. And why the, and they were also, those Africans were told, uh, don't talk to anybody about this. You could be killed for talking to anybody, anybody about this. So, uh, you know, I think that, that was an aha moment for me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is the town still inhabited or is it just for historical viewing? It is really just for historical viewing. Um, they, but you know, there there there's still some Afri some people who are descendants of them that are still there, but really it is um it's blight. Uh the the probably the most significant part of it now would be the cemetery. Uh, and we did go through the cemetery and there were some pictures in the uh, PowerPoint. We did go through the cemetery. Um, and, you know, some of the names on the, the tombstones we could kind of recognize, but the cemetery was in total disrepair. 
Uh, you know, some of the graves were all broken up. Some of them even had water in them. Uh, and the, they had a white monument for uh, Kudjo, uh, but his body was not there. Um, there was an, a white couple and their job was to go around to cemeteries and, and try to identify people and put them on the national registry. Uh, they said that Kudjo's body, no one knew exactly where it was. But, um, and there are two parts of the cemetery. You can tell one part is new and kind of well kept, and then the other part is not well kept at all. Um, so if you didn't know it was, but then there's a big sign that says Africa Town. And we also went to the, um, you know, the church that they built. Uh, they added on to it, but it is across the interstate. Um, and that's the one that has the, the head, the busk of Kudjo. But they've added on to the church. And it's it's a viable church today in Mobile. People do attend. Uh, but yeah. And even when we were there, there is a road. And that couple was telling us that, you know, that we were there on a Saturday. He said, that's if you were here on a weekday, there are so many trucks that trap, you know, that travel up and down here with dust flying everywhere. It's, it's very unsafe. And that's what happened to uh, to Africa Town when they split it up with the interstate. And that's the other aha moment. That's why they do a lot of our neighborhoods and communities. They split them up with the interstate. And so now, and then um, businesses struggle, uh, people struggle. And so um, they're, you know, it's just blight. And we drove over, you know, to the church, uh, but they were having a funeral, so we couldn't get out and go in. But we did drive over to the church and we did go through. We spent most of our time in the cemetery. And there's a note, when uh, a sign when you go into the cemetery. It says that um, we'll pay $25 to upkeep your grave. But they're supposed to be working on that too, rebuilding that. So those who are Omahans and know about the highway can relate to this story of building. Mm -hmm. Can you share a little bit about that, Brenda? The the interstate coming through? Yeah, like you said, it happens in a lot of towns. You lived in Omaha for a long time. You mm -hmm. probably heard stories of people talking about when the interstate. Broke. Yeah, actually, um, 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 my um, husband's family, uh, their home was bought up by the interstate. And, you know, it was split. And, you, you know, when you split, you you do something to the, the, the camaraderie of the neighborhood. You split them up. Now they're not, you know, they're not together anymore. They have a very viable neighborhood. And, you know, in some of our neighborhoods, um, and they talked about that in Africa Town, you know, some of them had their little ways of maintaining, like the women would cook and bake. And people knew that. And so, you know, they would come and buy things from them. But when the interstate came through, you know, that messed with that economic piece of it. Um, they couldn't travel back and forth because of, of the interstate. So they had to, you know, their children, they had to watch out for the children. The children had to be careful and going. Now, when we were there, they did have, they had a light, a stoplight now that goes from the, the cemetery area down to the church. But uh, you have to be, you know, you still have to be very careful if you are on foot and walking. Right. So. And I think the book mentioned, it was either the book or it was descended. I don't recall which mentioned mm -hmm. that a grandchild might be separated from grandparents. Mm -hmm. And right. you know how, how frightening that would be. Mm -hmm think that the child might try to cross the interstate alone right right and you know and they also talked about the school um you know they built their own school and then some years passed and they got a grant to build a school and Booker T Washington was very instrumental in that and he came down to help them with that uh which, which worked well but also the school was separated by the interstate too. So that was another challenge for them. 
uh, and, uh, and the other little aha moment too, in the book, I think it was the book or it may have been Descendant. Um, uh, what's his name is a, um, a descendant of the Africa, uh, uh, the Africa town. Um, Quest Love. Mm -hmm. Quest Love is a descendant. He's the one that plays the drums on, I don't know if it's on the, is it Jimmy Kimmel? Jimmy. Mm -hmm. On Jimmy Kimmel. Uh, but he is a, a, a descendant of um, Africa town. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and for the, as we were talking about the split in Omaha, for those of you who are not familiar, we're talking about Highway 75, which many of us drive right into our campus, right? Mm -hmm. That's what split up the, mm -hmm. um, so um, just back to people living or not living in Africa town, you spoke of the contamination and mm -hmm. it's, it's very well described in this book. Mm -hmm. um, and how you also said that how Alabama didn't follow a lot of laws they should or mm -hmm. take advantage of funding that might have been available to clean up some of that stuff. Do you think that it's happening now that they're trying to clean things up because of the historical site? Because they describe some awful toxic, toxic chemicals that are still pouring into mm -hmm. places where people were fishing? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think now that there has been some attention called to Africa Town, they may, you know, they're trying to clean it up a little bit. But I'm glad you mentioned that, Barb, because it brings together another part of the There was so much... Uh, stuff in the air from the paper mill um, that um, my internet connection is unstable. Somebody saying that? Every yeah. once in a while it, it cuts out, but okay. I, yeah. Um, that the, the, the ash from the paper mill was so bad that um, you had to wash your car every day because if you didn't, you got uh, stains on your the paint of the car. And if it's doing that to the car, just think of what it's doing to your body. And they um, they were big in gardening because that's how, you know, they grew up with gardening in Africa. So they were big in gardening. And then you have the same ash that's falling all over the food that you uh, you planted and now you're eating. And then they talked about how um, the waters were contaminated and people were fishing and they were, you know, catching fish, and that was a source of a meal for them. And as a result, um, many of them, as on the descendant, the young lady that was walking you through actually had cancer. There was another man on there who also had cancer, but there were a lot, the, uh, there was a minister on there who talked about sometimes they would have like three and four funerals a day. And uh, these people were, they were dying from uh, the, the ash and all of the other contaminations in the air, on the ground, and in the water. And, you know, the sad part about that is that, you know, that's their home. That's all they know, all they can afford. And at the time, they couldn't afford to move out. So it was... Um, it's like being between a, hot, a rock and a hard place. Just like they talked about all the jobs that came to the community and many of them became middle-class. But then when the jobs came into the community, the barbershops and all of that, then that cut out a lot of their money that they were getting because some of them had little businesses also. And so when you got other businesses that come in that um, have... Um, lot more to offer, a variety of things to offer, uh, then you start patronizing that business. And then you forget about your little black mom and pop stores in the community and the community suffer. Yeah, that's so true. You, mm -hmm. I think the one uh, description that really hit me was where they said that the kids would be playing 
Mm-hmm. And if it's when that ash started to come down, they knew they had to run and help their mamas get the clothing off, clothes off the line. Mm-hmm. Nobody had to tell them. Mm-hmm. Right. It was just kind of, you know, what they had grown, or you, they had grown used to it. And they were making the best of the situation that they were in, yeah. which was um, a strong set of people that had very strong values and they were very resilient. And the fact, the main thing with them, the 110 is that they stuck together and they fought back. And that's why that group was able to build a stable community a viable community with everything they needed right there. That's so true. Thank you very Mm -hmm. much. Mm -hmm. Now, Brenda came up with some really nice questions to ask the audience in polls. Do you want to use any of those? We're getting close to the end. Okay. Um, These don't have to be yes, no answers, right? Or do they? They do not have to be. Just pick out one you like and Um, It'll either come up as a poll or I'll throw it into the chat for people to answer on the chat. Okay. Would you like to see this, a wreckage of the slave ship? That'll be a poll. Okay. Mm -hmm. You guys can watch for a poll coming up here. Mm -hmm. Isaac's got that under control. Because in Descendants, you had differences of opinion. Some people said yes and others said no. Hmm. All right. We've got 100% of our people wanting to see that. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I would want to see it too. It's history. And then, um, do you consider yourself of African descent? Because there are a lot of us walking around saying, I'm not Africa. I didn't come from Africa. And although we may not, not have particularly come from there, but a lot of people in our family did. A lot of our descendants came from Africa. So right now we have 61% saying yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's another thing where, you know, in order to appreciate your present and your future, you really have to know where you came from. And I I don't think a lot of us have dug back far enough to know where we really came from. Had you heard of Africa Town before now? This is a close one. Mm -hmm. 52%. No. Right. You know, and and I'm from Alabama. I had not heard of Africa Town until you called with the the last slave ship bar. Hmm. That's history that we didn't know about. Let me share with you a comment that's come in, Brenda, because I think it relates to something in your your questions. It says, what a strong sense of community they had. Mm -hmm. If we had more of that now, we could be a healthy country again. Yes, Mm -hmm. I totally, totally agree. We don't stick together and we don't fight back when it's necessary (laughs) and in the right way. And the other question is, um, did you realize that Zora Neale Hurston was buried in an unmarked grave in Florida and Alice Walker went to Florida and did her tombstone and did her grave. And it was on, uh, I read a documentary of Zora Neale Hurston and it was absolutely beautiful. She did a wonderful job. So 65% of the people said they did not know that. I did not know that either. I, you know, I don't know. In my little world, I was thinking, uh, I was always impressed with Zora Neale Hurston when reading about her, and I just thought she was the bum, and I thought she was, I thought she had money, plenty of money, but she did not. She she struggled. Her father was mean. Her mom died, and that was her pride and joy. Then her father remarried, and he was very mean to her, and then he actually put her out, and I think she was like 15 years old. Uh, and she she did enough to go to Howard for a year and a half. And then from there, she just struggled and struggled and struggled. Uh, she was a, a you know, phenomenal writer and a poet and basically died 
cool and in obscurity. Their comment, excuse me, <coughs> um, about African tribes. Um, this woman is wondering, you know, she thought they would have worked together against any slavery actions for fear that any tribe could be taken as slaves. Um, I, 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 you know, I think sometimes we don't realize that there are really differences between tribal people, right? Right. And, um, there's, there's a, and again, I don't remember if this is the book or Descendant, but it talks about a tribe that figured out how to protect themselves from the Dahomey. You know what I'm talking about. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. You want to share that? Yeah. There were uh, two two ways that they decided they felt figured out how to uh, protect themselves because they know that the homies weren't going near water. So they built their houses on stilts in the water. And then there was another group that um, dug uh, tunnels in the ground so that they could hide from uh, the Dahomey's when they came. And, you know, Kudjo's community had uh, some things in place because they, you know, I'm sure they had fear of the Dahomey's all along. They had some things in place, but like, uh, you know, like most of our culture, a lot of our culture, you got somebody in the group who goes and spilled the beans. So when the Dahomies came to uh, Kudjo's village, they knew everything. They knew where people were running. They knew where people were hiding. Uh, you know, and some people were just, you know, mutilated and killed in their sleep. So we do not do a good job at sticking together. All right. Well, it seems like time has really flown. Brenda, mm -hmm. I'm getting comments about what a wonderful job you have been doing to share mm -hmm. with us. I can Thank tell you, you she has worked very hard because we've we've kept together since about August talking about this. And it's been so impressive to me that you mm -hmm. have dedicated your time and really taken on this task. And I want to thank um, Dr. Cynthia Gooch Grayson for suggesting you in this role. Um, do you have any final comments, Brenda, for the for the audience members about this book? Um it's a very good book. Um, it was a good history lesson for me. Uh, it was not long. It was a very, you know, it was an easy read book. So if you can, please get it and add it to your library because it is a wonderful book. And also, if you can, watch uh, Descendants. It's on Netflix. And it's about two hours, not quite two hours long, but it really is a documentary on the book. And it may give you, you know, some other, um, some other ideas too. And, you know, the, the last thing uh, um, that I want to say is, well, two things. This came from the um, descendants. It said, you have to love your history enough that you want to tell it everywhere you go. And the real test is not in coming to see something, but the real test is what you do after you leave. Uh, are you doing anything after you leave? Um, and I wanna thank Barb for working very diligently with me because I'm not technology proficient. And I do wanna thank Cynthia, who's like a child of mine for uh, thinking of me and inviting me to do the last slave ship because it was a wonderful thing. Uh, and I really enjoyed going to Mobile, Alabama. You know, and it just makes you want to go again. And I had a couple of people who said, um, who lives in Mobile, who lived in Mobile, said to me, I don't know why you want to go there. It ain't nothing. You can't see the ship. <laughs> I said, but I just want to see the area, you know, to feel a closeness to it. And it was wonderful, you know. I, I'm not one who want to walk through a cemetery, but uh, my friend and I, we walked through that cemetery, you know, and we recognized some of the names from the books and it brought it home. And then that white couple was, that was out there, they came up and they talked to us and they gave us some valuable, valuable information uh, because that's what they do. Uh, so um, 
I do want to thank all of you who came out, um, took the time out of your day, your evening, because I know, you know, this is, this is high tide time at home where you're trying to get ready for the next day, trying to get people fed and all of that. So I do appreciate the fact that you came out. All right, what a wonderful evening we've had. Also want to thank Metropolitan Community College Library staff for their annual assistance in helping us set up our book series and their kind and professional attention to anyone seeking a copy of the books. Mm -hmm. Whether it be during a pandemic, when the campuses were closed, or now that we're adjusting to book delivery at the Digital Express at the Fordham Hot Campus or a visit to libraries at the South Omaha Elkhorn Valley campuses. Um, if you are a resident of our four counties, you have a right to use those libraries. So keep that in mind. They have copies there. And I did notice we've got um, in the chat, the evaluation is there. And I know that um, we have our next slides up. So let me just speak to that slightly here. If you haven't registered yet, Black History Month is right around the corner. And this Saturday, we kick it off with our Black History Month kickoff. This year, we're partnering with the Omaha Community Playhouse. Admission is free. It includes a lunch, but registration is required. The chat has a link. And I will send out emails about this also, but there's a link there where you could sign up to participate. It is not virtual. This is in-person only. So for those of you who could come to the Fordham Omaha campus, you would have an opportunity to experience three workshops to help you explore the work of August Wilson in keeping with the Playhouse's presentation of Fences, which premieres tomorrow night at the Playhouse. Then... We want to keep you up to date with the book series because you want to get your book and read it so you'll enjoy the discussion in March, March 14th, 2.30 p.m. The next book is The Sisters of Auschwitz with discussion led by Scott Litke, who's the executive director of Omaha's Institute for Holocaust Education. Uh, there's a registration link also in the chat that's also free, and that is a virtual activity. Anybody, anywhere who can connect to Zoom is welcome. So thank you, everybody. It's been a great evening, and I want to thank Isaac for coming through with those great polls. Everybody have a good, good evening. Take care. And thank, thank you, again, you, Brenda. Thank you.